Let's pay homage to the lineage gurus, homage to the venerable man Liao Ming, homage to Master Sakya Zhengkou, homage to His Holiness the Sixteen Kamapa, and homage to Master Dukdan Dorji. Homage to the two jewels of the altar. Homage to the main deity of Homa today, Namo Sakyamuni Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, Namo Buddhaya. So, Tanzan Kato, Tutan City. All Dharma Masters, Dharma Educators, Dharma Teachers, Dharma Lecturers, Dharma Assistants, Directors of Temples and Chapters, and all disciples present here and over the Internet. Good afternoon, everyone. How do you do? ニューヨークから。ニューヨーク。愛してる。愛してる。チャレ。チャレ。オーラミコ。オーラミコ。ケケロモチョ。ケケロモチョ。スコイン。スコイン。イジワ。気持ちいい。気持ちいい。気持
rather than parasite. But the Tibetan Tantrayana subversion is very ferocious with a necklace of skulls hanging on her neck. So this is a protector in Tibet. But in Japan, that she can bestow lots of auspiciousness, lots of uh, dharma treasures to be bestowed upon you. So the two different practices uh, that's the mantra. And Manjusri Bodhisattva is also also means the marvelously auspicious or the greatly auspicious. So Manjusriya for Manjusri is Om Manjusriya. And for Mahasri is Om Mahasriya. Om Mahasriya Soha. Om Mahasriya Soha is her mantra. And her mudra uh, is like the mudra to invoke the Bodhisattva which is the open, the Lotus Anjali Mudra. This is so to invite the Buddha, the Bodhisattva, and the protector. The Om Ahom. Om. Om. Ahom. The three syllables. So the same mudra as the invocation for Bodhisattvas. And her image, she is holding a a weapon that looks like a a cannon or a fire arrow and the other hand is holding a skull cup or kapala filled with human blood and fire envelopes enveloping her and her hair is red the body is blue and the skulls hanging on her body she has subdued a uh, 52 uh, cult uh, leaders or deviant practitioners and hang the skulls on her neck. So in Tibetan Tantrayana, there are a total of 12 Mahasuris. So Grandmaster had painted 12 Mahasuris that belong to the Japanese Tantrayana, which is the elegant and graceful celestial maidens. So Mahasuri can bestow auspiciousness. If you want auspiciousness, you should become primary supplicants. Of course, nobody wants disasters and calamities. Everybody wants auspiciousness. I think in the Lotus Sutra, there is a chapter on the Mahasri as spoken by the Buddha. And 
And today, we perform the Homa of Sakyamuni Buddha, the founder of Buddhism. Of course, we don't have to introduce him. He's the founder of Buddhism, Sakyamuni Buddha. Most people would know his story, his hagiography. Grandmaster had visited India and performed pilgrimage over the eight uh, holy places, Lumbini, Deer Park, the, that's in, the, in Nepal. In, when he was born, he spoke I'm the only one in heavens and on earth. And most people thought that the only one means that he's the first and foremost. But actually, this I does not refer to Sakyamuni Buddha, but I represents the true self the great self, which is the same as Buddha nature. This I refers to Buddha nature. So in heavens and on earth, only Buddha nature is the only one. So this I refers to the Buddha nature. The same as Buddha nature. It doesn't mean that he's the boss, that everybody else is under him. That's not the case. But you are number one if you embody or if you have manifest the Buddha nature. And everyone is number one. No difference. Many people misunderstand that uh, Sakyamuni Buddha thought that he's the dominant or the, the number one and nobody else, but that's not the case. So we visited uh, the eight uh, sacred uh, pilgrimage sites. And I had this feeling or recognition, impression. Why did Sakyamuni Buddha renunciate that in the sutras it was recorded that he saw the sufferings of sentient beings as he was traveling through the four gates? and encountered a birth, aging, old age and death, uh, sickness and death. And then he realized that human life is very short. And there's also two sufferings, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sufferings. There are many kinds of sufferings. They all suffer that uh, moments of joy and happiness are very short-lived. And the time that we can utilize also very short. So he means that we don't strive to fulfill desires and instead we can live at ease and lightly and can purify and manifest Buddha nature. And Buddha nature is omnipresent, it's everywhere. And we invoke, whenever we invoke Sakyamuni Buddha, that he would descend because he's omnipresent. He's not exactly at one place. Some people said that the Buddha was from the past. That was 2,600 years ago. 
and then he's gone. So where is he now? Some people ask me. But actually, Buddha nature is omnipresent, is everywhere, at any time and any space. That's the meaning of omnipresent. And according to what's mentioned in the Vimalakirti Sutra, it's the same. Time does not exist. Space, also spatial dimension, also does not exist. That's why in transference of consciousness, in his tiny room, he could embrace all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas inside his room, and it did not feel that the room is small. So the little thing can embrace the big things. It's boundless. So boundlessness. So he has this supernatural or transcendental power that a time and space special dimension can change. And he has no gender. So, but does that, does that mean by or non-gender? It used to be male, female, and then what letter is it? And X. In the past, there are only two genders, men and or woman, but now we also have X, which means you're not man, you're neither man nor woman, or you can be both man and woman. So it's like a neutral. But uh, what Vimala Kirti manifested can transform. So that's in the Sutra. That's incredible. The goddess who sprinkles flowers is a female, and Sariputra is a male. So, Sariputra, practicing our hardship, never gazed at women. So, whenever he sees the goddess who sprinkles the flower, he would look down or close his eyes. But uh, the goddess also has transcendent power. And she's a bodhisattva, a great bodhisattva. And Arhat is the, the smallest one of the four sagely realms. So the goddess says, okay, you don't want to look at me? Then she transformed herself to become Sariputra. And Sariputra became the goddess who sprinkled flowers. So, uh, changing into each other. So, <laughs> he wasn't looking at you, but I became you. <laughs> became a woman. Uh, so, he, uh, he breaks through the gender boundary. So the goddess who sprinkle flowers, so she sprinkle all the flowers in the sky as an offering to the arhats, and all the arhats ran away and hid. 
because they didn't want to be touched by the flowers, but the flowers stick to them and they couldn't get rid of the flowers. So they had such great, tremendous, uh, transcendent or supernatural power. Man becoming woman, woman becoming man, and just numerous transformations. So there's no limitation in the time and spatial dimensions, the past, present, and future all becomes one, and all the space also become interconnected and become one. So that's why there's the saying that uh, there are many flowers uh, passing by, but not even a petal sticking around. This came from Vimalakirti. So they don't stay with, with them. So there is no uh, attachments whatsoever in their hearts. So even after going through so many flowers and grass, but none of them stay with them at all. Like Sakyamuni Buddha, he would go to a place and uh, bringing all of his disciples passing through a deserted area and then said, let's stay overnight here. What? Stay overnight here? And he said, no, this is good geomancy, but this is a very deserted place. No people, nothing, no houses. Where would they stay? And he said, the Buddha said, no problem. Sakyamuni Buddha also had uh, transcendental power. So he invited uh, Triatrimsa Deva or Indra to descend. And the Lord Indra understood what Sakyamuni Buddha wanted, so he planted a three uh, three clumps of grass and immediately they turn into big palaces. So Sakyamuni Buddha's disciple can enter into the palaces and stay overnight. And the next morning, when they woke up and left the palaces, and they turn around, and all that's left are the three clumps of glass, grasses. So that's transformation and transcendental power. Because spatial dimension intrinsically does not exist, and time dimension intrinsically does not exist either. That's why we call it that the three times are one and across ten directions. So Buddha nature, Sakyamuni Buddha, is everywhere. So whenever we invoke him, he would come. He descended upon our fire offering. One time, Sakyamuni Buddha, when I was performing the Bardu deliverance of the thousand Dharma vessels, I fell asleep. <laughs> Halfway, I was too tired. I fell asleep. <laughs> Perhaps I would have slept till morning, and then the Dharma vessels, the ships, were just wandering around because the presider of the ceremony fell asleep. And so the Dhamma ships were just floating around. But there was a ray of sh light flashing right in front of my eyes. And I woke up and took a look. Oh, it's Sagamuni Buddha. 
So I woke up, well, well, what was I doing? I was performing the Bardu deliverance of the thousands of Dharma vessels. So immediately I concentrated and completed my Bardu deliverance. And at the by the time I finish, it's dawn, it's daybreak. So once Sakyamuni Buddha woke me up, and Sakyamuni uh, Siddhikarva Bodhisattva is very kind. Every time during the Dharma teaching at the Seattle Lejang Temple, I don't know whether you are falling asleep, but you are very quiet, and Gavastu is very quiet, so quiet that I fall into a deep sleep. And Siddhika Bodhisattva saw me that I, that my body is starting to to fall forward, like fishing, you know. It's called fishing. I almost fall asleep. So Siddhikabha Bodhisattva was so kind, so he put on a seatbelt on me. <laughs> From my back, he seated behind me, right? and then he put on a seatbelt on me. And I saw it passing in front of my eyes and so that I can sit upright and sleep well. <laughs> I really uh, sleep well. Every time Master De Hui drive me and I get on the car, and I would chant the sutra and do a dharma practice, and then I would lose consciousness. When I open my eyes, it would be at the rainbow villa. So every Sunday, when I come to the rainbow temple, Everybody says, everybody says that the scenery in I-90 is really beautiful, but for this past three years, I've never seen any sceneries on I-90. So I spend it in dreams. That's how, that's how it's been. <laughs> There's no time in the villa. And, and the lake, the sun and moon are long. This is a couplet. Mountain villa, no time. Which means no time dimension. And in the lake, it's no special dimension. So, always like this, all the mountains surrounding the rainbow temple. No time. They're all the same things, but they're all ever-changing, depending on the weather. But at the center of the lake, the sun and moon are long. The sun and the moon are on the lake. Reflected on the lake, but the lake in Chinese sounds like a, a wine bottle. So there is no spatial dimension. So you're drunk in this villa. But please don't drink, okay? I'm not telling you to drink. It's just an analogy. 
，所以释迦牟尼佛他本身便没有什么时间跟空间，没有。Sakya Muni Buddha has no time nor spatial dimension. He's everywhere. Don't ask where Sakya Muni Buddha is. He is omnipresent. Even after 2,600 years, he's still here. When Grandmaster performed the Bodhu deliverance of the thousand Dharma vessels, he woke me up once, just once. Very grateful to him. The daughter asked her mom, "Mom, is my skirt beautiful? Guess how much is it?" And mom said, "I know it's expensive. I can tell." And the daughter asked, "How can you tell from where?" And mom said, "From your dad's face." Two、uh, madams are talking, and Madam A told Madam B, "You look tired." And she said, "Yeah, my husband is in the hospital, and I'm watching over him day and night." And the other madam asked, "Why don't you just hire a nurse or caretaker?" To help, and she replied, "Well, because I have hired someone." You cannot laugh at that. A boy, a boy really likes a girl, but did not dare to tell her. So he followed her to a noodle shop, and finally he. Uh, conjure up his courage and ask,、uh, "What do you call, or what do you call in Chinese?" And she said,、uh, "The beef noodle soup." <laughs> One day, a、uh, Dracula got. A gin, an elden lamb, and then ask the genie, "I want to be fair skin and loved by women, and can drink more blood." So, and the genie turned him into a、uh, what is that called? <laughs> Like a tampon. So the wife said, "How come housework is never ending?" And the husband said, "Well, you did not agree to my getting another wife." So on to the main topic. From South Africa, Lian Hua Yongyan. Homage, Grandmaster Simo. Question on、hmm, the ritual of collecting water in a bowl. When we move our house, can we just take it down and move it to our new house? Is there any specific ritual for taking it down and putting it up? Or should I do a dharma practice first before putting it up on top of the new house? Or should we discard the old bowl and place a new bowl at the new house? Thank you, Amitabha. So he said, just to take down the old bowl and then put it up on the new house. According to what I know, 
the ritual of collecting water in a pool is uh, it's uh, like a, to repair the feng shui of a house. So, so when you use this bowl ritual, is you use the the brain that has never touched the ground. So when the rain is cleaned, water is collected in a bowl, it would alleviate the negative energy of the house. So it's to repair the feng shui inadequacies. So when you move the house, you should not worry about the bowl because perhaps the new house has good feng shui. Then you don't need the bowl anymore. If, it is a, if the new house has a bad feng shui, then don't move to that house. But if you just want to be safe, then you can just place a new bowl. It doesn't cost that much, right? Why do you bother by taking the old bowl? So when you move to a new house, and you just want to do the negative energy, and so you can place another bowl on top of the house and to perform the ritual of collecting the rootless water in the bowl. Just buy a new bowl. It's very cheap. Why do you bother taking down the old bowl from the old house? So that's the answer, okay? Question from Malaysia, Lianhua Sung Yao. Grandmaster, first I like to offer my gratitude to Grandmaster for your compassion to allow all beings filled with Dharma joy. In Tantric Buddhism, there are three classes of dragon beings, celestial dragons, earthly dragons, and sea dragons. It is a common knowledge that the sea dragons oversee rainfalls and alleviate droughts. Can you please tell us the difference between the celestial dragons and the earthly dragons? Also, the dragon king treasure base is primarily offered to the sea dragons. May we offer it to the earthly dragon by burying it in the ground? <laughs> Oh my gosh. In Tantric Buddhism, there are three classes of dragon beings, celestial, earthly, and sea dragons. Let me ask all of you. Celestial dragons, earthly dragons, and sea dragons. Can anyone explain them? This uh, Lian Wang said, he's never heard of celestial dragons, earthly dragons, and sea dragons. That's what he wrote. In Tantric Buddhism, there are three classes of dragon beings, celestial dragons, early dragons, and sea dragons. Mm, if you have cell phones, check. It's written that it's just a folk belief, it's not tantric Buddhism. Did I say it? Oh. 
So it's a folk legend. I have no cell phone. So if you have cell phone, you can check. So it's not in Tantric Buddhism. So it's as a folklore. I remember in of the 5,000 year of China history, Xian Yan Xian, there were several uh, major gods who descended 5,000 years ago. Uh, there was the clan of Fuxi, the clan of Niwo, the clan of Panwo, Panku, Fuxi, Niwo, Shenlong, Shenyan, Zhuren. They are considered, they were considered gods. Do you remember? You have studied history. And we are called the descendants of Yan Huang. Yan is the Yan Emperor from the Senlong clan. And Huang Di, the Yellow Emperor. So we are the descendants of Yan and Huang. So the Senlong clan oversee the uh, farming and agriculture, and Zhuren clan is in charge of fire uh, to eat a uh, cooked food. And the Yu Cao clan teaches people how to build uh, residences like huts and building structures. And the Fuxi clan is the one who draw the trigrams. And the Niwo clan is to create people. And the Pangu clan is to create heaven and earth. And Shenyin clan is in emperors the earliest emperors. So in the era of the Xianyan clan, there was a Yang Long. It's the dragon clan who raised uh, dragons in the pond. So, raising the dragons, and dragons really love, you know, the whiskers of the dragons, to, to play or to pull on the whiskers of the dragons, and the dragons would be really pleased. I learned this from reading. So this is kind of a legends. Uh, the legend of the three ancient like mythical legend, legend. But not in Tantric Buddhism.
We know there's the Dragon King Sutra. Did it mention about celestial dragons, earthly dragons, and the sea dragons? No. So celestial dragons, of course, those who fly in the sky. And the earthly dragons, I think, are underground. As the Feng Shui masters, the Venerable Mang Liao Ming is the master of Feng Shui. So first, it's about dragon. So we always check the dragons under the ground. Is how the dragon moves. Is how the energy moves. So by looking at the mountains, that's dragons, and on the flat land, they are also dragons. So if if you are higher, even if it's only one inch, that's considered dragon. If you're one inch lower, that would be the water. So it doesn't mean that they have to be mountains or hills, but there are dragons everywhere, even on the flat land. So celestial dragon is, of course, the dragons in the sky. They move in the sky. And dragons are also in the field. So that's one of the trigrams. And water, not that they even more. Uh, the sea dragons, uh, river dragons, and uh, uh, stream dragon, and the smallest one is the well dragon, inside the well, inside the well. So in ancient times, they drink water by relying on wells, and there are also dragons inside the wells. So the difference it's easy. The celestial dragons is in the sky, and the earthly dragons are on the ground. That's it. Very simple. So the dragon king treasure base is primarily offered to the sea dragons. Can we offer it to the earthly dragon by burying in the ground? Yes, there are treasure bases to be buried on the ground, in the ground. As a feng shui master, you can bury something. When you build a house at the four key pillars, and you can bury a vase, and then you can put the, some dragons, uh, dragon silver in it, which means the house will be protected. So the four corners of this Homa Hall, right there, 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 there. So when you're building it, you bury the vases, and inside it there's a dragon silver in it which means there are earthly dragons protecting that building. So there's some feng shui method. That's the function of the earthly dragon. And a feng shui master sometimes would look at the key formula for looking dragons, looking for dragons. You climb up high up and look at how the dragons move. As a true master, you would know what is a true dragon, false dragon, life dragon, or dead dragon. So, if they twist and turn a lot, that's the life dragon. If it's very uh, flat, 
That's just like a dumb pig. That's like that's a dumb dragon. Just like a dragon. If you play with the air, your children would be big and dumb. So they would be like a dumb pig. It's like a dumbo. So if you're a master in feng shui, you always、uh, look for the life dragon with twists and turns all over. That that would be if it's just like a straight and. Dumb. That's like a dead one. Doesn't move anymore. It's a dead dragon. So you just check the、uh, lively. I mean, how lively they are. The vitality. Yeah, it's kind of dead pan. Dead. That's definitely a dead dragon. Then. Then you need to recognize what is the the real dragon and the fake dragon. And there are many dragons, and then you need to point out、uh, the real dragon and the one that's at the front most, and the rest are at the back. Then that would be the real dragon. Or if the rest are all in the front and there's only one at the back, then the one at the back is the real dragon. So you need to recognize all the different dragons that can only be、uh, discerned by a true, a real feng shui master. But most ordinary feng shui masters would not be able to. So the venerable Mang Liao Ming taught me all this, and now I have taught you that too. So that's about the earthly dragon and celestial dragon. It's inconceivable. It's immeasurable. Inconceivable. That、uh, the jade emperors belong to the dragon beings. So their true form are dragons. That's celestial dragons. So the devas of the thirty-two heavens, all the heavenly kings, all have the form of dragons. That they are referred to as the celestial dragons. So their true forms are in the form of dragons, and the earthly dragons are under the ground, and the dragon king treasure vase. Can it be offered to the earthly dragon by burying it underground? I don't know. I have never heard of it. It's very good that you offer to sea dragons. You don't need to offer to the earthly dragon because the earthly dragon is only talked about by feng shui masters. And also at the four corners of the building. So the dragon silver needs to be blessed, and it can it can protect、uh, the the house. And the next question: There are four levels of yoga tantra. There are the kriya yoga, upa yoga, yoga tantra, and the highest yoga tantra. The yidams or main meditational deities in the kriya yoga are easy to visualize and practice. But why most of the yidams in the highest yoga tantra have many forms, with many arms and legs in various colors? For example, the image of Kala Chakra, whether it is the faces or the arms or legs, there are four different colors of blue, red, white, and yellow. What is the reason for these various colors? You're asking me. 
like Kalachakra, his white arm, that's white body. The red arm is for the red body, and the blue body is for the qi, to symbolize the qi, right? So, Kalachakra image. The face of Kala Chakra is it yellow? <laughs> yes, yellow at the back. It's blue too, right? Blue, red, and white. Primarily, the blue represents qi, vital energy. Are you showing me the image of Kala Chakra? <laughs> the yellow at the back. That's in dual body. So the yellow is for the consort. Kala Chakra has four faces, three necks, six shoulders, twelve arms, and twenty-four hands. Uh, his center face is blue, right face is red, the back face is yellow, the left face is white. And both the Buddha Father and Buddha Mother have three eyes. And the four faces represent the body, speech, mind, and the great bliss of emptiness, wisdom, and form. And the white left neck, the red right neck, and blue center neck represents the three channels inside the body. Left leg is white, right leg is blue. And wearing a tiger skin skirt with pearls and jewels and Vajrasapta in the top knot. He looks majestic. So these are all symbols. White means white body, red means red body, the blue is the energy. And the yellow is for the Buddha Mother. The color of the Buddha Mother. Just visualize it accordingly. So the symbolism is for the white body, red body, and Qi, which is blue. The Qi is blue. And it's here, it's different. That white, red, and blue necks represent the three channels. The central, central channel, left and right channels. Left leg is white, right leg is blue. Adorned with Vajra Scepter in his top knot and with the tiger skin skirt. And he's wearing jewels. It looks magnificent. And the center face is blue, right face red, uh, left face white, and back face yellow. So white represents purification, red is meditation, yellow enrichment, and blue for subjugation. So they are all mean different things. So, we use all these different colors as symbols. Tea, channels, light drops, and also their, uh, their work or actions or functions. 
what they can accomplish. Okay, let me test you. Who is the Buddha mother of Kalachakra? Vaisana. It's the youthful goddess. Yeah, because all uh, Buddha mothers are all very, uh, very youthful. Who's the Buddha mother of Yamantaka? It's Saraswati. Every one of them have their own consort. So when I talk about Nirmala Kirti Sutra, you need to prepare the book. You need to copy it so that I can expound on it. There are several, there are seven different versions of Vimalakirti Sutra and we would like to use the one translated by Kumara Jiva. He was born at the uh, Kucha, Kucha country. Kumara Jiva translates it. So don't mistake it and print a different version, okay? I heard that there are s seven different versions, but we would like to use the one translated by Kumara Jiva. Mom asked me, what thing can bear eggs? Uh, the hen, that's good. Who else? Mom too. Did I ever bear some eggs? But uh, you said that I am a dumb ex, so I was born by mom, right? The sister told the brother, tomorrow I will not go to the kindergarten. And the brother asked why. And the sister said, because the teacher told us not to talk, but I keep talking. Well, but the teacher keeps talking, right? And the sister said, and I want to become a teacher when I grow up, and so I should start practicing now. So the teacher asked me, if you encounter a tiger, tiger how do you uh, save yourself? I will call him dead. Why? Because even the ferocious tiger never eats his own cubs. Yeah, you will be eaten up even when you call him dead. The brother asked the younger sister, I heard that you pee in your pants in the kindergarten. And the sister said, no, no, it's not me. Then who was that? It's my butts. Uh, that's the concept of no self. Can you control yourself? You can't even control yourself. How can you have yourself? There's no one that can uh, control yourself. Because if you can control yourself, then you have become a Buddha. Three question and answer. Question. 
A friendship after a while can become a romance. But how come a romance after a long time cannot become a friendship? The answer the towel, after use for a long time, it would become a mop. But after using the mop for a long time, can it become a towel? Mm, good answer. Question? Why don't you like to go to the bank? The answer? It's like the eunuch not wanting to go to the whorehouse because you know you don't have it. Why do you want to insult yourself? Hmm? Other than fragile things, what else do you do? You place it softly is when you let go of your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I just play a fruit of Chinese. In Grand Master's exposition of Vimalakirti Sutra, uh, many scholars love Vimalakirti Sutra. There are lots of things inside it that are beyond uh, people's imagination. Like the man becoming the woman and the woman becoming a man. It's already mentioned in the Vimalakirti Sutra. You know, the arhats don't look at women, they always look at the ground. So Vimalakirti transformed the arhat to become a woman. That's incredible. And the goddess who sprinkles flowers, Vimalakirti's wife is the goddess who sprinkles flowers. And Vimalakirti uh, eats meat and drinks alcohol. So there's the saying, uh, the meat and alcohol just pass through the intestines. Uh, but the Buddha stays inside the heart. And the meaning of Vimalakirti means uh, immaculate name. So it's stainless, immaculate name. So Vimala Kirti, that's Sanskrit, and was transliterated into Chinese, and it means stainless and immaculate name. Ambassador, you want to speak? Mm. He needs a microphone, I cannot hear. Just now, Grandmaster said that Vimalakirti Sutra had seven Chinese translations and three are more famous Kumara Jiva is the version that Grandmaster is using and the Mang Xuan Zhang also translated the 
and he translated into the, uh, the paintless name. So it's the same. Yeah. So pure and immaculate name. So the sutra has many names. Vimala Kirti Sutra is also called the Inconceivable Sutra of Liberation or the Taintless. So the sutra is spoken by the Taintless One. Although Vimala Kirti had the wife and also drank alcohol, and he did things done generally by mundane beings, but he's uh, stainless, completely immaculate. Mm -hmm. No contaminants. So, no impurities. So, he views man and woman equally. So, man can become a woman, woman can become a man, can change into each other. Because the arhats think that the women are filthy. In the Buddhist Sutra, it was mentioned that women have five leakage, and men are more precious, and women are less so. But he didn't think so. Man can become woman, woman can become man, back and forth. So his view was different. So everything is equal, one. So Sakyamuni Buddha believed that the man can be ordained to become monastic, but not the woman. The beginning, they were all men, no woman. And look at in Tibetan Buddhism, there are only male lamas. There are no female lamas. And lamas mean masters. And the monastics, they are all men. And when the woman renunciate to become a nun, they would wear white. As I remembered, I saw it in the Canton Monastery. They did not wear the lama outfit. They wore white robe. But at Tribute School, it's equal. So in the eyes of the Buddha and in the eyes of the Arhats, they don't look at women. So when the dragon girl attained Buddhahood, so in her attaining Buddhahood, she had to transform to become a male first before attaining Buddhahood. So they had this uh, belief that uh, only man can attain Buddhahood. So at that era, there is man and woman are not equal. But in the Vimalakirti Sutra, men and women are equal. So the sutra is very special. That's why it's called the Inconceivable Sutra of Liberation. So you can do anything. However, you still need to maintain your purity while doing it. So that's the meaning of the sutra. You can do anything, but the question is, can you maintain your purity while doing it? And if you're not entangled by afflictions or by any thoughts and you're completely pure, then you uh, have success in your spiritual cultivation. So there's no taboo that you have to avoid this or that or etc. No such thing. You can do anything. However, it's all pure. If you can do it, then you can do anything. If you can be like that, then you can do anything. 
if you cannot maintain your purity while doing many things, then you cannot do them. Very simple. If you go to the casino, then you're obsessed with gambling. You're addicted to gambling. Then you drown in it, then how can you be pure? So that's why we go to Las Vegas and we give you 10 bucks or 50 bucks and then after you spend your 50 bucks, you stop. So you still maintain your purity. So you just play the, play the jackpots. <laughs> it's like exercise, right? and 50 bucks is gone. That's fine. And you still maintain your purity. But if you are drawn in it, then you are tainted, then you should not do it. You should not go to the casino. That's all for today. Omani, bear me home.